Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to this live Q&A hosted by Clathlip and Pallet um, on the subject of orthodontics. Uh, my name is Rhiannon Allen. Uh, my daughter was born with a unilateral cleft lip um, eight years ago, so I've been volunteering with Clapper um, since just before lockdown. And today I'm joined by Claudia, our other volunteer. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Claudia. I was born with a unilateral cleft lip and palate. Um, I was part of the CYPC um, and I turned 18, so now I just volunteer for Clapper doing things like this. Thanks, Claudia. Um, today's session is all about orthodontics and cleft lip and palate. Uh, we'd like to welcome cleft specialist Georgina Kane and Rhiannon Jones, who will be answering your question. Um, Georgina and Rhiannon, do you want to introduce yourselves? Yeah, hi, I'm Georgina. I'm an orthodontist and I work in one of the cleft services in London. And I've been working with Clapper for a couple of years now as an event facilitator. Hello, my name is Rhiannon Jones. I'm a dental therapist working with the cleft team in the southwest of England. Uh, I've done that for about 15 years. I'm very happy to answer any questions about oral health and prevention. Thank you both for joining us today. Um, thank you as well to everyone who has submitted um, questions in advance. If you've got a question uh, whilst you're watching, please pop it in the comments. Uh, someone from Clapper will either respond uh, directly to you um, or pass it on to us. So shall we get going with the questions? Okay, uh, question number one. Uh, I've been told uh, my son has a double tooth growing where his two front teeth should be. He's 16 months old and was born with a unilateral cleft lip and gum notch. Is this something I should be concerned about? Should it be removed? Okay, yeah, so um, uh, it's really difficult to comment, obviously on individual cases, because you kind of have to have a look and see depending on that patient but we can talk about it in general terms um so we normally try and be as conservative as possible especially when a patient's younger we want them to keep hold of their teeth for as long as possible as long as it's not causing any problems like pain or discomfort um with double teeth sometimes it's that one tooth has grown and created an extra one next to it or that two teeth have grown and kind of fused together so the management might be slightly different depending on which one is which, but if it's a baby tooth and he's only 16 months, we expect him to keep their top front teeth till they're around six or seven years old. So it might be that if we can manage to hold on to this tooth for that long, um, that would be something that might be done unless it's causing problems. I think the thing to be aware of with double teeth, if it's in the baby teeth, is it can replicate in the adult tooth. So your cleft team will be keeping an eye on that and sure, I'm sure. And at some point, maybe take an X-ray to look into this and monitor how the adult teeth come through and then manage those if there's any problems. Um, in terms of management of filling the little notch that comes through, you can add a little bit of composite filling to smooth off that edge or reshape the tooth as needed. You should normally have as part of your cleft team a restorative or a children's uh, specialist cleft dentist. So they normally be the ones who can make those plans and um, give you a kind of full explanation of how they plan to manage it. Um, okay, so the second question is, are teeth more painful for cleft children? Our two and a half year old daughter seems to have suffered far more than her twin. Okay, um, they're not necessarily more painful um, just because there's a cleft. Um, we know each patient has very different responses to pain. Some are more temperature sensitive, so, you know, with hot and cold. Um, and even patients, you know, in the same family, you might have siblings that have the same diet, use the same toothpaste, or have different responses to pain or soreness. Um, it may be that they were just teething a bit more uh, when those teeth were coming through than when they were a bit younger. And sometimes if a tooth is quite displaced, so out of its normal position, um, which may or may not be related to the cleft, sometimes that can cause a little bit more irritation or discomfort for the patient. And that might be something that's noticed. And if you notice anything like that, then just highlight it to your, your cleft dental team and they can talk to you about options. Yeah, I, I would only add to that. Um, in my experience, sometimes when people have had their lip repaired, the soft tissue and nearer the teeth is more like the sensation of the inside of your lip than gingery or gum that can normally handle it. So if it's pain 
that you feel when you're trying to brush it. It might be worth moving to a much, much smaller toothbrush. They even make them with just a few bristles on them. So you can be a little bit more specific on the, on the area. And just from my experience, sometimes I think when a child says it hurts, it's hurting when they're brushing and it's more that it's hitting the area of the surgery rather than actually the gum. That's all I was, would add there. Brilliant, thank you both. Um, question three, uh, my son is three years old. He's had both surgeries, but still has a small hole in his mouth, which now has a tooth cutting through. Um, is this normal? Should I be concerned? What will happen? Yeah, so the, the baby teeth kind of want to come through where they want to come. Um, and we can't necessarily always control where the baby teeth come through, but we can manage that. And then more commonly, um, once he's got sort of the adult dentition of teeth, we can then look to um, align these or straighten them with braces as and when they come in. Um, so as long as it's not causing problems, I wouldn't w worry too much about it, but you can always obviously have a check with your team to make sure and be reassured on that. In terms of the little hole in the mouth, so you can get what's called a fistula in the palate, which some um, sort of cleft people may recognize. It's just a little hole in the non-bearing, non-tooth bearing part of the mouth. So more in the palate or the roof of the mouth. Um, it doesn't normally have an effect on the teeth and we should normally be able to work around it. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that again is that, you know, as um, you said, is having a good chat with the team just to see what the plan is, because it's likely that when um, the canine tooth is ready to come through, that they may talk about bone grafting. And that's probably been mentioned in the past. And my dental therapist hat is just thinking when you have a tooth that's displaced like that, it is very difficult to clean, but it's so important to clean because that tooth can also become decayed or infected as well and they're even more tricky to treat so again maybe a toothbrush that's very very small or only has a few bristles on it may be easier to keep that uh, clean and just watching the diet so that your children have enough of a break between food because snacking even on healthy things can actually be quite bad for teeth because you're never giving the mouth a chance to to rest which is when it becomes a bit more acidic thank you yeah, thank you guys. So we've had a question come through on the chat, um, which is what toothpaste would you recommend for a three year old who brush their teeth every day, but teeth do look yellow? Rhiannon, do you want to take this one? Yeah, happy to. So um, a child under six tends to have a slightly lower dose of fluoride in their toothpaste. So it's going to be around a thousand parts per million. But on the back of the toothpaste tube, you'll see that as abbreviated as PPM. And most children's toothpaste do have that level of fluoride. And when they get to about six, they go up to the adult dose of fluoride. Your team may say different if they are used to looking after your child and they feel that they're a little bit more at risk. They may recommend swapping swap to it sooner. Um, when you say the teeth are yellow, generally speaking, baby teeth or the first set of teeth are quite white. So if they're yellow, I'm wondering what might um, be causing it, whether it's something in the diet, perhaps, and whether they're happy letting you brush their teeth as well. And perhaps if they're pulling back and not and, and enjoying it, that might be that you're not being able to clean everything away at all. But the fluoride in the toothpaste is vitally important because it's one um medicine that's usually how we'd explain it to children it's a medicine that the tooth can suck, suck up soak up and really use to keep itself strong so it's really important that you do have um a fluoride in the toothpaste and children's toothpaste don't really have much of an abrasive in them like an adult toothpaste would so they're, they're not designed for stain removal of any sort certainly okay um, so should I do the next question? Um, it was, what age should children be seen by an orthodontist for bone grafts? So bone grafts are normally required for children who have a gap in their tooth part of their arch. So the alveolus and often referred to as an alveolar bone graft. So the tooth bearing part of your gums. Um, normally patients are seen in the cleft service around five years because that's when you have your five year review. So the orthodontists will try and see them as well at that time, just to kind of get a overall steer at that appointment in terms of timing and how we can plan over the next couple of years for the bone graft if it's required. Um, there's quite a wide age range that people will have bone grafts because we tend to go more of dental age than your chronological um, 
you know overall age so there may be some children who are already a bit earlier and you're more sort of six to seven and there may be children who develop a little bit later in terms of their dental development and they may be up to like the eight or ten year mark so as long as you're being seen by your team regularly and um, they will investigate that hopefully earlier than the seven year old to give you time to have x-rays and design a, a plan for you um, once we think they're ready for the surgery, you'll probably be seen in the joint clinic again with your cleft surgeon and the pediatric dentist um, and the rest of the team uh, to discuss the overall management of the, the bone graft and the time it takes to complete the surgery. As there's probably a few appointments before it's actually undertaken and talk about what you can expect afterwards in terms of recovery. Brilliant, thank you. Um, question five is, what age do orthodontics then start? So um, my son is 10 and due to have his bone graft this year, one of his front teeth is facing sideways now. Okay. Yeah, so again, we tend to recommend braces or orthodontics regarding their dental age and how their development of which adult teeth they have rather than just their age in years. Um, so once this her son has had the bone graft, um, we would need that to heal for around th three to six months, take an x-ray to check it's okay and that the team are happy with it. And once it's successful and they're happy to proceed, you could consider maybe some sh a short course of braces or orthodontics just to straighten up those front teeth, particularly that one that might be causing a bit more concern if it's facing sideways. Because you're likely at 10 years old to still have some baby teeth in other areas of your mouth, you might not be able to have your full course of braces. So we try and keep it to a shorter course and just straightening up maybe the front teeth or just leaving it until you're ready to have the, the full set of braces. And it's all completely dependent on the individual patient, how much it's bothering them. Are they willing to wear braces? Do they want to wear braces? Are they gonna be able to keep the braces clean? And thinking about how it's gonna affect the, you know, the rest of their life as well. So having braces as an extra short course may mean more time off school for appointments. And if you have this, whenever you have braces done, we always say you must wear retainers afterwards, which are important to comply with, otherwise the teeth are gonna to wanna to move back. And then you might need regular appointments still with your orthodontist to check your retainers. So it's kind of taking all those things into account to consider whether it's something that you want to go ahead with a bit early, or if the child's happy and that they'd rather just wait for everything to come through and then have one set of braces. Um, some children are completely happy and that the twisted front teeth don't bother them too much. And then it's completely fine to wait until they're ready to have the, the braces. And then some have them early because they have a bit more of a concern and they may still need a second course of braces later. Okay, should we move on to the next question? Thank you. Um, I'll also add to that one, actually. That I was going to say, you were nodding, Claudia. Yeah, I didn't get braces until I was 17, but I could have had them straight after my bone graft, but mm. I <laughs> did not want them. Then we get on changing the plan, and I think it's really important that actually the cleft-affected person is the centre of the like treatment and that they get the choice because like at that time I probably could have had braces but I was like I don't want them like I knew I wasn't going to take care of them I wanted to be able to eat crisps and apples and everything and it was my teeth didn't really bother me then so I waited ages until I was 17 and it was so much better because I wanted them so the treatment was a lot smoother yeah um, so yeah I definitely just recommend also speaking to your child and see what they want to do um, okay, so question six is, what happens if my child's two adult tooth has already started to grow through his gum notch, pre-gum notch surgery? Mm -hmm. So normally um, the tooth can be straightened up into the arch or the line of uh, where the rest of the teeth are, the tooth bearing part of the gum, once that bone surgery has been completed successfully, and um, the teeth should be able to be moved into the line with the rest of them using braces after that. So your team, your team will manage that. Brilliant. Okay, um, question seven. We've been told our son will need braces, but he's really against it. Um, he's had so much invasive treatment already and we don't want to put him through any more. Are there less invasive options like removable braces or retainers? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so actually following on from what Claudia said, um, I think it's really important to listen to the patient and what they want. And it's okay not to have orthodontics or not to have it right now. It's an elective treatment. And the most important thing is to make sure it's the patient's decision and something that they're happy with, because we are then going to ask them to look after the braces. Um, and it's all about risk benefit really with the patient. They should be able to, as part of the team discussions, talk to you about what the braces might achieve. So straight to teeth and what you can expect in terms of how to look after the braces, commitment to appointments, changes to your diet, all the things that Claudia mentioned. And if that's not something that they feel they want to or are interested in undertaking at the moment, that's totally within, you know, that they're, they're, they're entitled to that. And I think it's really important to respect the, the patient and work around them. Um, they can always come back to the service when they're ready, even as an adult. Um, and care can be provided later when they feel more ready to take it on. So that's sort of answering if they feel like they've had a lot going on and thinking about braces. In terms of the second part of the question about less invasive options. So removable braces take, you know, can help to straighten the teeth, but you can imagine if you've given this to someone that doesn't want to wear it, they're able to be removed. They end up just not being worn. They almost require more engagement from the patient and something that's fixed on because it's up to them to be putting it back in um, and be being kind of engaged with the treatment. And the final mention is of retainers and retainers are different from braces. They're fitted after braces to hold the teeth straight. So just to wear retainers on their own without having braces first is probably not of any benefit to that patient. And again, it requires them to be engaged with the treatment to want to wear them, it's elective. So I'd probably just say it's maybe something that even just a six, 12 month break from what sounds like maybe you've had a lot of appointments uh, previously, and then another kind of review and chat with the team in the future and see how you feel about it. But at no point do you have to have it. Yeah. Okay, so we've had a question come through the chat, so I'll do this one first. So this is, which toothpaste do you recommend for a one plus year old who was born with a cleft lip, really struggling to get him to brush his teeth? Thank you. Shall I take this one? Yeah. Okay, so it, it can often be um, the flavour of the toothpaste. So you definitely still want a, um, a fluoride toothpaste, about a thousand parts per million, but you want a, a tiny amount. So we don't put the same amount on the toothbrush for a baby as we would for ourselves. So we're talking about a small pea sized amount. That's plenty for the number of teeth that your child will have. And if you want to, you can sort of smudge it into the bristle so they're not getting a full dose of a, a big blob of toothpaste. Um, there doesn't need to be lots and lots of water with it, either with a children's toothpaste. And also, I think sometimes it's finding at the right time for your child to brush their teeth and not picking a time where they're already maybe a bit fractious or a little bit annoyed. Um, sometimes it can be a habit that you get into that before they come out of their high chair when they've enjoyed their meal, that's maybe a time to brush their teeth. Giving them the toothbrush themselves to chew on when they're in a safe place like a high chair, a bumbo or a, a, the bath, for example. So you're taking the toothbrushing routine slightly out of the normal routine. And then as they get a little bit older, you can play little games with them. They can choose. You can have two toothbrushes and it's not shall we brush your teeth? It's are we using the green one or the pink one? So you give, give them a bit more autonomy. Um, but I'm thinking a lot of the time with little ones, it is, it's more the taste and if you have um, a fistula, as um, you know, we were talking about earlier, there is the possibility that the toothpaste is actually getting up into the nose as well, which if we took a blob of toothpaste now and stuck it up our nostril, nobody would like that. And it stays there a long time. You haven't got any way of getting rid of it. So it's worth thinking about are you putting too much on and going through a couple of the different baby toothpaste that are available. Maybe find one that isn't minty and doesn't sting. And there are some the one that comes to mind to begin with is called Aura Nurse, so O-R-A Nurse, and they are flavour free. So they're, they're very mild, they're, they're very good toothpaste. And again, it's just not using too much. Is there anything you would want to add to that, Georgina? No, I think you're right. I, I definitely would maybe recommend the flavour free ones or obviously changing up the routine and then changing up the kind of equipment that you're using and see if seeing if that makes a difference. Just coming out of that old routine that might not be working so well and finding a new way to make it part of their daily routine. Yeah, there's a lot of good um, videos and little things you can find on YouTube that make um, make it a little bit more fun. 
Um, there are lots of songs you can sing. They drive me potty because I've sung them to my own children for so many years. But even down to little things like a, um, just a cheap pair of sunglasses in the bathroom and you've got to brush your teeth so well that mummy needs to wear sunglasses to look at them because they're so bright. You know, make them proud of having clean, healthy teeth. But yeah, and what, what works one month won't work the next month. So as most mums, you have to be ingenious. <laughs> Okay, thank you guys. So the next question is, my son is 13 and about to start his orthodontic journey. Do you have some before and after pictures to reassure him that he will one day have straight teeth? Yeah, so, so most services or departments should be able to show pictures of the type of brace that they're going to be using and then possibly before and after shots of patients with similar issues and their similar outcomes. Um, it does depend on what type of brace you have for us to recommend which photos. We normally recommend the British Orthodontic Society. They have some leaflets such as one on fixed appliances, which are the train track braces, which are quite common. Um, and in that leaflet, there's a picture of a patient who's had before and after braces. This is not cleft specific. Um, it's for all children who are going ahead with braces. But what I can do is pop the link for that on the chat, and then you can ac access those resources um through there they're quite useful and there's different ones depending on what type of brace so you can match it to the one they're having uh, brilliant I've, I've got just a question to, that's come through on live chat just to squeeze in for the next one that says what orthodontic interventions are needed for a child with a severe protruded premaxilla okay um so again we don't have the the age of the patient um, so it, it's probably over the course of their kind of journey from birth to, you know, to adulthood, as there may be a number of um, orthodontic procedures required, starting right from very early babies can have some um, kind of lip strapping, so very early treatments, depends on where you work and what, what your service offers, some places do it, some don't. Then moving on to possibly some having some early braces like we talked about before around the time of the bone graft again some services do it before some do it after the bone graft to get some type of straightening of the front teeth though you might not have all the adult teeth through then when you get into your teenage years you tend to have a full set of braces they might be top and bottom once all the adult teeth have come through and then instead of that or as well as that you may then consider the jaw surgery route, which is known as orthognathic surgery. So it's a combination of jaw surgery and braces, and that's done once you've stopped growing and not all patients require it, not all patients are interested in having it. And that's the talk kind of for your team, but because we don't have an age, it's difficult to say maybe at what point they're thinking about next, but just to expect over that whole patient journey that there may be multiple times when braces might be required. So those regular appointments with your CLEF team are really helpful to keep an eye on any interventions which might help at each sort of stage. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so next question is, does it hurt to have braces put on? Which I feel like I can also answer because I had them for years and I'm the biggest baby known to mankind. It didn't hurt me. The only thing that hurt was the tightening slightly, and that was more of an ache than anything. But that's just my two cents. <laughs> yeah, no, really helpful, really reassuring, I think, to hear from someone who's had them done. Um, braces don't hurt to be put on the teeth. It's actually quite relaxing. You tend to just lie back in the chair, um, and there's a few things going on in your mouth. They might do some washing with some water, a little bit of hoovering to clear that water up, and a bit of air. There's no drilling, there's no local anesthetic or injections. It's quite um, straightforward. It's just gluing them on the front of the teeth. Um, it does take about 45 minutes or an hour or so to do. So you can always bring the stuff with you like headphones to make you feel a bit more relaxed. Um, and yeah, to reassure you, it's not an uncomfortable thing to have put on, but I don't know if you remember Claudia, the first time once they've been put on for those first few days especially it can get quite achy and a little bit tender so you just have some pain relief and avoid anything too hard to eat to be kind to your teeth and then each time you come every round six weeks to have the braces tightened again for that day or so after it might just feel that little bit of tightness little bit of achiness um but it shouldn't be painful 
Yeah, no, I was going to say. I, I, sorry, oh, sorry. sorry. It's, okay. Go on. <laughs> it's okay, you can go. I know I, I had braces as a child and an adult and the, I, I didn't find it painful, as you say. It's more of an ache afterwards. But what I did notice, um, and probably because I think about toothbrushing more than most, yeah, I couldn't use my electric toothbrush for a day. Mm -hmm. Annual brush just for the first phase of training adjusted and then happy to go back to normal again just some teeth can feel a bit tender sorry Claudia <laughs> <laughs> that's okay I think we lost you for a bit but I think you're back now so yeah um but yeah no I was saying the exact same as well like I this is coming from someone that was so scared of dentists and orthodontists I would not sit in that chair I would go in I'd be like hi and I'd stand and I I would just expect him to tell me things without looking in my mouth and I was so scared to get braces on I sat in the chair and he I was like can you please do it I'm sitting up like I don't want to do it and I lay back and it was like genuinely this is I was shocked that it was actually relaxing in the way that it does not hurt they don't touch your gums they don't fiddle around in there they just literally put like a dot on each tooth put something on do some thing that hardens it on and then just put a wire in and I was I mean I don't want to brag but I was lucky that I didn't get any pain afterwards either like I had no aching and I was shocked all my friends like it hurts so bad and I was like oh not for me I was fine um so honestly it you will think it's really really scary and the minute you're sitting down in that chair you will still be so scared but you lie back and actually the orthodontist is somebody really good so you can ask them to explain everything for you yeah. and take it at your own pace like I keep on saying you're in control of your treatment so I just asked him to take breaks as well like once he did one I was like can you just do one and then I'll know and they were literally like yeah it's fine so yeah I definitely recommend things like that and on the other thing saying about the um pictures before and after I think it's really important to note that I really wanted my teeth to look these perfect pearly white teeth that you see everywhere that's got every single tooth. And when I actually came to realize with my braces that my cleft smile is going to look a bit different than other people's like I'm missing teeth. I don't have the same like alignment of all of them. But after my braces, I'm actually really happy with them just being straight and having like a set of teeth, even though there's some missing. So it's maybe not going to look what you see in the photos of yeah. what your friends have, but it's actually, actually it's going to be fine for you. Yeah, everyone's different. Everybody's got different shape, teeth, size of teeth, color of teeth. So I think those pictures can be helpful. But again, that's not a blueprint of exactly how you'll look. You can just see how braces move things. So you get a bit of more of an understanding of where someone kind of comes from. Um, yeah. yeah, that's really helpful, Claudia. I think yeah. I think the other thing to say on that as well is um, I think everyone has, again, quite very different experiences of discomfort. So you might be speaking to someone in the school playground and they say, oh, mine hurt for a day and someone else says mine hurt for a week. And the people, if it's a bit more tender, it can be more worrying. And that's just, just to reassure you that everyone's just slightly different and responds slightly differently. Um, but it's, yeah, it should never be anything more than kind of an ache and a discomfort. Yeah. And you might find that throughout your journey, you'll change what you want. I turned up and I was like, I want this. I want this tooth shaved down, added one here. And I ended up being like, I'll just get them straight and that's fine. So you might change and that's also fine. Yeah. Um, OK, so we had one come through on the chat question that I'll do first. So that is what age do you, we get told if a child needs to have a bone graft surgery? My child was meant to see the dentist of the cleft team yesterday, but it's now been pushed back till August. Will I be told then? Did they mention the age of the child now? Um, I don't think so. Just okay. what age? Yeah, what age do we get told if our child needs a bone graft? So it it so a child needs a bone graft if the the cleft has gone through the tooth bearing part of the gum. So the the arch where the teeth all lie. If there's the gap in that area, then they would need a bone graft. So your team should be able to individually assess the patient, um, and then advise you on that if there's any. If they're not sure, then when the patient's at the right age, they might take an X-ray. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much if you have a, an appointment coming up in summer. Um, hopefully, that's a, a chance that you can confirm that with the team, and then they can make arrangements for that. Okay. So the next question is: Will braces affect my son's speech? He's worked so hard with the SLT to speak clearly. I don't want him to feel like he's moving backwards. Oh, yeah, I think that's really fair. I think that's really often a concern um, for, you know, cleft affected patients when they've gone through so much, you know, speech development, they made really good progress. And that's the last thing we want to do either. It, de it depends on which type of brace. All of them have slightly different effects 
on speech overall, none of them are very likely to have any long term negative impact on speech. Some braces, um, if they cover the palate or if they're slightly bulkier, depending on what type of bite you have and what we're trying to kind of a treat. Um, they they may have a little bit more of a change in speech. The, the train track braces often have very negative, if any, effect on speech, um, and it's very, very temporary. Even with something that's covering the palate, um, normally it's something that kids are really good at adapting to. So just a little bit of practice and confidence with the appliance in. We tend to say, go home, read a chapter of a book out loud, get used to it. And, so then when you're in school um, or out and about, you've got a bit more confidence and then your speech will return. Um, anyone else add anything? No, that's great. Thank you. Um, I've got another one that's come through live chat for our next question that says, um, my three-year-old boy who was born with a cleft has his um, canine tooth through, but also another tooth that's coming behind his front. What should or could happen with that? Mm -hmm. So again, it will be an assessment with your cleft team. So probably your um, paediatric children's dentist or restorative dentist as part of the cleft team. It's important to count out which teeth are there. So if something's missing, if it's the normal amount of teeth, but one's in a different position, or if they've grown through an extra tooth, all these things can happen. And um, depending on that, then they will decide the management. I think, again, if it's a young patient, it's not causing them bother. I don't think you'd want to be jumping in to take out extra teeth if they're not causing them problems, but it might be formed as part of their overall plan or as part of another procedure. Um, so yeah, I would just get it reviewed by your team. I think it's just important to count out which teeth are present so they can work out whether it's part of his normal teeth in a different position or an extra tooth. Brilliant, thank you. Um... The next question then is, are there any tips for dealing with braces, pain relief or brushing and so on? Um, I can definitely do the brushing bit. <laughs> OK, um, I think it's important that we make sure that patients got, you know, is able to clean their teeth before we put the braces on, because if you're not cleaning your teeth well, when you've got braces on, you'll find it very, very difficult. And then you're at risk of gum problems, bleeding gums, possibly gum disease in the future and, and decay on your teeth as well. And there's nothing worse than doing wonderful treatment on somebody's teeth only to take the braces off and find out that they've got little squares or marks on the teeth or holes. So we choose carefully to begin with. We don't put braces on people until they're brushing really well. And then ideally, once you've had the braces fitted, it might be the orthodontist, it might be the nurse working with the orthodontist, or they may have a hygienist or therapist in their team. But ideally, just a few moments spent showing you how to look after your braces, because a normal toothbrush might not be enough. And even when you do use a normal toothbrush, you've got to really think about brushing your teeth twice. So you almost want to come along from one side across to the other above the braces. So you're cleaning the bracket and the bit of tooth between the bracket and the gum all the way along and then you come below the bracket and you come all the way along again the same tooth but you're now doing the bracket and the bottom part of the tooth so it does take longer to look after your teeth and depending on where your teeth are positioned they may uh, advise again that single tufted toothbrush it's a, it looks like a toothbrush but with very few bristles on it or sometimes very small bottle brushes that can just sort of go between the wire that's in the brace and the tooth. It's just really important to always make sure that they're as clean as possible. And the most important one is at night, making sure you go to bed and there's no food stuck around that brace and nothing can go wrong while you're sleeping. Um, and also, I think, you know, orthodontic treatment, it's always going to have a better outcome if you've managed to keep everything clean. If you do break anything that you call the team very quickly so that it can be looked at um, and repaired. But certainly that, that's what I'd say with the brushing. The evidence would say an electric toothbrush is slightly better. The sort of round head oscillating, rotating toothbrushes um, for cleaning braces. And you might want to add a fluoride mouthwash just so that you've got a little bit more fluoride in the mouth. However, it's better to use it at a different time of day to brushing. So if you um, brushed and flossed and use your mouthwash, for example, and you did that morning and night, that's still only twice you get fluoride, where if you brush in the morning, maybe you use flu fluoride mouthwash after your lunch, use it after your tea, and then you brush again before you go to bed, that's four times you've managed to get fluoride onto the teeth as well. It's just twice as good. Thanks. Yeah. 
That's great. And then I would just add on to that in terms of the, the rest of the question. So Payne, we talked about that it, it tends to be not too uncomfortable, but it can be a bit achy, especially in the first couple of days. So we normally say whatever you take for a headache, say similar pain relief, often paracetamol or ibuprofen, whatever you're able to take, um, we recommend those. And then you should get given some wax by your orthodontist. So you can roll this into a, a little ball and add it to anywhere that's rubbing. It almost acts like a little blister plaster for anywhere on the brace. Nothing should be sharp, but even so, our, our lips, our cheeks, everything's quite sensitive. So anything that feels like it's rubbing a little bit, especially in the first few days, you can do that. Some people struggle getting the wax on. They feel like it always falls off. So you can go on YouTube. I think there's some videos on there that can show you how to put it on. Um, or bring it in to your authentic and say, I don't know how to use it, and they can show you. And they should do that before you go home as well with the braces on. And then in terms of other dealing with braces, Brianna sort of covered it, but essentially um, diet as well is something else we're really aware of. So two aspects of diet, reducing the amount of sugar to prevent any decay or uh, stains to the teeth, and then um, making sure you don't have anything too hard or chewy or sticky that can break the braces. Um, again, that resource that I mentioned before from the British Orthodontic Society has a little leaflet which discusses different braces and asks questions like, what will happen to my speech? Can I play sports? What sort of things can I eat? So hopefully that could be helpful to have a look at as well. Perfect. I turned yeah. my camera off for a second so I could go and run and get some of these products for you. So oh, well done. You, you can see on the screen, but that's a single tufted toothbrush. So it, it's same toothbrush handle, but a lot shorter the bristles and you're able to get those around the brace. We do tend to recommend a much smaller head toothbrush than perhaps you're buying in supermarkets. So it's worth looking. You really don't need more than about two and a, two or two and a half centimetres worth of bristles. But if you go to your average supermarket, they, they look more like they're meant to clean the treads of your walking boots. So it's small is much better to fit around that. And then I was talking about the tiny little bottle brushes and that's what they look like. So they are actually designed originally to go between people's teeth, but actually they go really nicely around the brackets and underneath the wire as well. And then Georgina was mentioning about the orthodontic um, wax and that's what it looks like. It comes in little strips and you just pinch off a little bit. You need to warm it up in your fingers. You can roll it around in the palm of your hand and stick it on. It, it, I think it's always wood. You'll always be given some of this. And what's the point in being uncomfortable? If you've got a little bit that's rubbing, put it on there. What will happen is your lip will get thicker very quickly over the next couple of days and it will deal with it. It won't stay sore the whole time, but there's no point in suffering. We can post this out to people. So if you've run out or you've got given one of these and it was brilliant and you can't find one anywhere, ring your cleft team and they'll be more than happy to pop one in the post at no charge for you as well. Yeah, I think I'd also add to that. I remember when I had braces, I hated cleaning my teeth. It takes so much longer than when you just average like so I used to, I have those little brushes. I don't know. I think they're called TP brushes or something. Yeah. I used to line them up in like smarty colors because you get like red, purple, yellow, green, all of them. And I used to like pretend that they were like smarties and like pick one up because you can't really have chocolate when your brace is on. So I used to pretend that they were like the chocolate that I got and I used to like take time. And that's like something that I used to do just to, like get me through doing it because it is long and it's boring. And I used to like try and listen to music and stuff because I know there were days where I didn't do it before I went to bed, but I tried to. So doing things like that to make it more fun and enjoyable, even when I was 17, or something that helped take them like just the boringness away from it absolutely and like you said you don't even have to be in the bathroom I think most of us have brush our teeth in the bathroom because you're using toothpaste you need to spit it out but but things like the little brushes um, and the single tufted you can just do that while you're sat watching the tv and, and the little brushes even come with a lid so you just take the handle off pop it on as a lid you can wash it when you go to the bathroom later and I think when you're distracted by reading or watching the tv you'll do it for a lot longer and they feel amazing. When they feel amazing, you know it was worth doing. And, and when you come and you see us smile at you as well, you know it was all worth it. <laughs> okay, so we've got a question that came in online. It's quite similar to a question we had earlier, but I think it's useful to talk about. So my son, who is three, was born with who was born with the just the cleft lip, and his two teeth under his cleft go inwards instead of flat in front. Would his second lot of teeth come through the same way? What age will they get braces? So it's it's really hard to say if a tooth come through in a certain position. 
um, whether the adult tooth will definitely follow that. You can imagine how much growing they're going to do in general between now when they get their adult teeth. The top front ones tend to come through between sort of six and eight years old. So all over that time, your dentist will be monitoring them come through. Um, and then at that point, once they're through really, we, that's only when we're able to assess their position. It may be that they don't come through in exactly the same position, but they might not come through straight. And then you could think about braces. And as we said before, it might be something, if it really concerns them, that they could have fixed a little bit earlier than their full set of braces, which they'd have as a teenager. So once the teeth are down, they can be moved with a brace, the adult teeth. It kind of depends on which other adult teeth they have because you need stuff, you need teeth to attach the brace to. So it'll just be something that your team reviews and manages with you. And most importantly, what bothers you know your child? Because if he's not got any concerns, we don't want to jump in and do treatment because as we talked about, we're probably not going to get a good outcome and it's, it needs to be on their terms. Okay, perfect. So the next question we've got is, my 17 year old is really self-conscious about her braces as all of her friends have had theirs removed already. She doesn't want to smile and often covers her mouth to hide the braces. How can I help her feel a lot better help her feel better about wearing braces what happens if she wants them removed early I would just quickly add to this one because I got them when I was 17 um I was kind of late to the party as well and I was like kind of grateful for finally getting them because I'd seen an orthodontist for so long but I was shocked at how my friends just didn't care like as in I don't know about like her friends and stuff but I would say for my friends I walked into school and I was really worried about it because I was like everyone's had them you know you're like turning into an adult you don't want to have braces on it's like quite a young thing and I walked in and I was like oh god oh god and everyone was like oh like how's your day been how's this and I was like oh yeah fine and then they're like oh my god you got braces I was like yeah and they were like okay and then this kind of carried on with your day like people might acknowledge it but after that like it's kind of cool because you can talk to your friends about the colors they got and different colors and oh like at Christmas time you can get green and red and like you can like customize them it's fun so I think like it was just trying to find those little things that I think if you can find them joy or like the good things about braces it definitely helps and I think it is difficult when you're a cleft you normally are either early to the party with things or really really late but like for me I just think you, I was really shocked at how no one really cared about me that much they were just like okay move on so yeah that's what I'd say about it and I think these days now braces are a bit more widespread in older patients adult patients I think that there's there's many adults now having treatment sometimes it's they have braces when they were younger and then they wanted to have a, a second set because everything's kind of they want it a bit straighter again um so ultimately it's about trying to encourage the patient to see kind of the long-term game and what the what outcome they're going to have and is that what they're looking for and will they be happy with that and trying to encourage them on that sometimes it can be helpful to have a look at where the teeth were before you started the braces and then maybe an updated photo of where you are now just to see how far you've come. Um, and that can sometimes be a reminder because because it goes on for quite a while, the treatment. Sometimes you forget where you started and, and what they're for and what they're doing. And um, so just a little reminder may help. Um, I know that sometimes, obviously, with COVID, that hasn't probably been helpful to make progress. So, again, people might just say I'm you know, a bit fed up with them. We talked about the fact that braces are elective and no one has to have them. And at any point they say, no, I really don't want these anymore. Then you can have them removed early. It's your choice, you're in charge of it. Obviously we want support from the team and from the parents, um, but it's, it is up to the patient. It's their, it's their treatment, their decisions. Um, so we want to give them the chance to really kind of find out what it is that's bothering them is there anything we can do to address that and then maybe having a break from them or or taking them off a bit early if they feel that they've made good progress they're happy but they don't want to continue anymore and um, normally your cleft team has a clinical psychologist as part of the team so it could always be worth speaking to them about strategies of managing it around other people so the friends or um sort of social situations that might help Thank you both. Um, we've had another question from live chat, which is quite, it's quite pertinent actually, because my daughter's going through something similar. It says, uh, my six year old's adult tooth has started coming through his gum notch already before his bone graft. Will he lose this tooth? 
So we talked we talked a little bit about um, what happens when the teeth come through before the bone graft. It, it depends. It, depends really on the individual case, um, the position of the tooth, the quality of that tooth, and is it gonna affect the surgery or is it gonna not be in the way of the surgery? And then they'll be able to move that tooth into a better position once the bone graft's been done. Um, so if it's bone, if your bone graft has been planned shortly, then that should be made clear by your team. You should never be surprise and they've you know they come out on operation and they say oh you know had we not communicated what should be done this should all be part of the plan before they go for that procedure so it, it does depend on what they're having done and where the tooth is and which tooth it is and the quality of that tooth but just because a tooth is coming through before the bone graft into the the site of the notch doesn't necessarily mean it has to come out if that's any help yeah, I was thinking, I, I think most of my patients assume when we talk about bone grafting that they think of bone as being hard because the outside of bone is hard, mm -hmm. but actually the bone they harvest to put around the teeth is the spongy bone on the inside. So if you actually take some of the hard bone out and you look inside a bone, it's more like a sponge and that's what they're using. So it's quite easy for them to sort of mould it around what's there and, and the teeth. I would say from my perspective, that tooth needs to be really clean because it's in the site of the surgery. Yeah. So that 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 is the most likely reason someone would lose a tooth is because it's become diseased, infected, or it has such a massive hole in it, it has to be taken out. So I, I don't think it's important to remember what kind of bone we're using, that it's not hard bone that we're putting there, it's spongy and we can mould it around the tooth, but keeping it clean before, during and after the surgery. That's really interesting. Thank you. I hadn't actually thought about it like that before. So thank No, you. I think people hear bone and they think yeah. hard. Definitely. That's, that's not what we're using. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, okay, next question is, is Invisalign available to adults on the NHS? Um, they appreciate it might not be suitable for all cases. However, where suitable, whilst the high initial cost may be higher than fixed braces, it requires less frequent appointments with the orthodontist during treatment, uh, thereby freeing up clinicians' time. Also, if the cost of Invisalign is prohibitive to the NHS, is there an option for patients to pay for it under the care of an NHS cleft team, possibly? Mm -hmm. This is a really good question, very topical. And um, there's a couple of parts of it, so I'll just break it down. Um, Invisalign is not likely to be available on the NHS in a UK cleft service. Um, these types of devices are used in specific circumstances, tends to be in adult patients, as mentioned, um, privately and possibly in more straightforward cases. Um, the most important thing is that your authentic will try and choose the appliance which they think is most suitable to you, not just to free up their own time or, or make it easy for the service, but what's going to deliver the best outcome. Um, so the type of fixed appliances that we often use, which are the train track braces, have a very wide use, very a strong research for a long time and deliver high quality outcomes, which we know can be more predictable um, and precise in terms of moving the teeth and then how they look afterwards. So that's why we would aim to often use these braces as we have the most control, because we want to get you the best result. Now, aligner type of braces, so Invisalign is a, a brand of one type of aligner, and they do have uh, their place and they can move teeth and straighten teeth, but it may not always get you the, the best result. And it depends who's undertaking the treatment. So sometimes these are undertaken by non-orthodontists, um, just dentists in general practice, I think it's really important, whoever you're undergoing treatment with, that you're aware of their specialty and what they're able to deliver. Um, I think Invisalign has very good marketing. Um, so that's why we all know the name of that one type of aligner. I think the most important thing is choosing what's right for you in terms of your dental health. Um, so normally aligner type treatments are done privately and then in terms of this, the second part of the question, can I do a bit of both? Um, unfortunately, the NHS doesn't normally allow you to mix an NHS and a private treatment plan together if it's a combined treatment. So it's normally one or the other. We sometimes use the analogy like it's like going to one school, like going to state school, but going on the school trips at the private school and kind of dipping in and out. 
um, we tend to want to work as a team and deliver you an overall team shared care, which is difficult to do if people are working in different services. I think if you're going to go down that route and want to explore that a bit more, all patients are entitled to you know, second opinions and ex seeking treatment that they want to have done. But I would definitely speak to your cleft team before doing that, just to let them know your intentions and maybe where you plan to go. And so that they can liaise with anyone else who's involved in your care from, from a healthcare perspective, um, whether that's letters, correspondence, informing them of the treatment that you've already had, all of those sorts of things. Um, just let your team know and have the discussion with them. Any anything else to add to that or any anything not clear? Not sure. Okay, so we move on to the next question. So we've had one come through on the live chat again. Um, so is it common for children with clefts to have an underbite? Will this be noticeable from an early age or noticeable after the bone graft? Yeah, so when we talk about underbite, often what we're referring to is the the kind of lower teeth biting ahead of the top teeth. Um, and it can be more common in uh, cleft patients because of the surgery that they've, they've had to their top jaw, it means that sometimes the growth of that jaw is a little bit restricted, or sometimes it's just part of the, the family history and that their lower jaw is a little bit stronger as they grow. So it's likely as you grow, your lower jaw grows for a bit longer than your top jaw. So it may be that any underbite you have, if it's mild, may kind of increase towards the end of growth. But as we know, everybody grows differently um, and to very different extents. Sometimes we can gauge it through family. So what, what kind of mom and dad, um, how did they grow? And looking at that to give us a bit of an indication. Um, so sometimes they can worsen, but sometimes not. And then depending on how severe it is or how much it bothers the patient may steer them towards just having braces or having a combined braces with jaw surgery to have movement to that top jaw to correct the underbite. And then what was the second part of the question? Um, it was something about the bone. Uh, yeah, bone will graft. this be noticeable from an early age or noticeable after the bone graft? Yeah. So it depends on depends on how the individual patient grows in terms of it being noticeable from an early age. Um, it may be something that isn't noticeable at an early age, but as everyone goes through that high school teenage growth spurt, it may become a little bit more noticeable. And normally the bone graft isn't changing the positions of the jaws or changing the, the bite. It's just, it's adding bone where, where it's missing. So it shouldn't normally have a strong effect on the, what we're referring to here is the underbite, which is, Correct them is reverse overjet. So you might sometimes see that on letters or hear it in the clinic. And that's just that sort of um, discrepancy front to back. Um, so we tend to call it something different if you hear your, your team using different terms. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the next question we've got is um, actually quite topical. Um, I've been reading about jaw surgery and about how teeth need to be moved into position first. Does this mean they'll be out of alignment until I have surgery? And isn't this really uncomfortable? It's a really good question. A really fair question. So when you're having, if you go for the jaw surgery approach, it's combined braces and surgery. We want to move the teeth with the braces into the ideal positions for after the surgery has been done. So it's more about tipping the teeth front or back. It might be that um, that underbite that we're referring to the reverse overjet can maybe become slightly more prominent before you go ahead for the jaw surgery. Having said that, start from where you start, the teeth will always be straightened up with the brace, even if you're going to go for the jaw surgery. So normally patients don't mind too much that they've got a slight change in the uh, position of their teeth because actually they're looking straighter, so they're, they're still happier. Um, and they're not moved into any sort of quite strange positions that you wouldn't be able to manage. If you're having jaw surgery, it tends to indicate that there is a discrepancy between the jaws or something that's ideal to be corrected. So you probably actually adapted really well so far eating with maybe a slightly different bite than you were planned. So you're very much likely to just be able to adapt to the teeth moving with the brace. It shouldn't be uncomfortable. You shouldn't struggle to suddenly eat or um, function. 
I think a really important resource is the Your Jaw Surgery website. Um, again, it's by the British Orthodontic Society, but we'll post a link on the chat. Um, and it has videos of step-by-step -step patient journeys, which can be really useful so that you can see patients going through that pre-surgery process, what you can expect, what sort of things happen. Um, but no, it's not normally something, it's not normally uncomfortable and they're not normally pushed out of alignment. They're normally just straightened, um, but moved in slightly different ways if they would have been if you didn't have the jaw surgery. Brilliant, thank you. I think this is a really good follow on question. Um, it looks to be our final question as well. Are there any alternatives to jaw surgery? Yeah, so yeah, so jaw surgery is normally done when you've stopped your growth um, and the team are able to assess you as your, your kind of final finished growth. So this is as an adult. Um, it depends on what your concerns are and the size of the discrepancy and what you would like to achieve from the treatment. So sometimes you can have just braces, which may be able to straighten the teeth. They may be able to correct um, any front to back bite that you're not happy with, but not always. Um, sometimes you could have just upper braces if you want something more simple, which can straighten the top teeth. Might be happier with your smile and then not have to go down the route of the jaw surgery approach, which is obviously a, a bigger thing to undertake and should only be if, if something if you're concerned about. Um, it depends. It just depends on what you want to achieve and the type of bite that you have. So it's all individual. Um, and I think your team will be able to tell you if you don't go for the jaw surgery approach, what you can expect to happen. And if you do, what would the outcomes and the expectation would be? Um, so there's, there's, there's other alternative options, but it's quite dependent on what you want to achieve. And that there are cases where, unfortunately, if you want to have your, your top teeth biting over your bottom teeth in a certain way, that might be the only option to achieve that. So if you don't want to go down the surgery approach, we'd have to explain, depending on your bite, different ways of, of being able to do some treatment, but accepting possibly some compromise. I think you said it earlier as well, Georgina, nearly all cleft teams have either a clinical psychologist or a counsellor, and they work with people before, during and after the surgery. It might be worth talking to them yeah. and just raise concerns. Um, because generally once people have made the decision to have it and I see them post-op, there's hardly ever a time where someone's regretted ever having it done. But they may have been the person that changed their mind two or three times leading up to it. You know, and my own daughter needs orthognathic surgery, but she doesn't want it. But she's only 15 and I feel that she's got a lot more growing to do yet. So there's no pressure on her. And then uh, just two weeks ago, mum, I don't like my teeth like this. Well, you remember they said, if you want your teeth like that, there's only one way you can have that. So it's just telling you the information or yeah. your child information and just letting it settle in. But there yeah. are people in the team who can, can talk you through it. Yeah. And as you said, it's not something definitely that's a decision to be rushed into. You don't need to do it now. You can take some time, especially maybe in that, that you know, A-level time or you going off to uni. It feels like there's so much change going on in your life that now is not the time where you want to do a gap year you can always come back to the team and review it and see how you feel after that. If it, if now doesn't feel the right time, the door doesn't shut on you. If you've been offered it and you say not for now once, you can always go back to the service and reopen that discussion. Does yeah, anybody, I, oh, sorry. Are you going to go? Did I was just going to add that. I think it's um, kind of important to know as well that I think a lot of the time in cleft treatment, I always felt like jaw surgery was the end thing to have. Like I was just like, that's the norm thing to do. Same with like having another like rhinoplasty and things like that. And it wasn't until I kind of got there and they're like, well, it's an option, but you don't really, it's not a thing you have. It's not a right of passage for cleft patients. Yeah. Like you can yeah. do other things. So I realized that actually sometimes you actually some have to be the advocate and be like, are there other options? Because the surgeon might just yeah. go with the one that's easiest for them to do. And I think as well, it was really cool to hear my surgeon turn around and go, I literally did a jaw surgery with someone that was 65 the other day. So I was like, you really can return at any time. So <laughs> I think like it's sometimes like once you've done your cleft treatment and you're 17, 18, I wanted to be out there for a few years and not go yeah. to hospital and then take the time to decide because it is quite yeah. a big surgery. And like you say, people don't regret it, but it's sometimes nice just to have the time away to really work out if that's what you want to do. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, I was just going to squeeze in one more question, if that's OK, that's come through direct chat. It's a two part question. Um, the first part of the question is my six month old son has just had his first surgery four weeks ago for um, I think it says vomiplap lip and nose. Uh, will his gum gap be the same until his bone graft or will it be closed during the next surgery? Um, the second part of the question is more dental therapy. So I thought we could ask Rianne on that in a minute. Don't know if you want to do the first. Wait, yeah, do you want to just read the first part of it again? Yeah, sorry. My six-month-old son has just had his first surgery four weeks ago for mm -hmm. flat lip and nose. Mm -hmm. Will his gum gap be the same until his bone graft or will it be closed during the next surgery? So so you, if you've got a cleft lip and palate, um, and alveolar, so it's it's going across that the sort of tooth bearing part. You would correct the the lip normally in the first surgery, the palate in the second surgery, but there may still be that the notch if it's there, the gap in the tooth bearing part of the gum. That's when it will be corrected is at that eight year old time, so the alveolar bone graft time. So if you're, it depends on what your team has, has told you, is the type of cleft that they have. But it sounds like if they've they do have a gum notch then yeah that will be treated um at the time of bone graft which is around eight years but the, you know there's a bit of variation to that and the, the the timing for that is for their dental age to allow their adult teeth to erupt into that space brilliant thank you um so the second part of the question is uh when do we start to brush teeth is it when you can see it trying to break through the gum can you in fact over brush Okay, that's a great question. I mean, I think the the best thing is that to maybe start even before you see them coming through. It can be quite soothing for a baby who's teething to have a very small baby toothbrush. You can even buy little, they're like little rubber sleeves that go over your finger with just a few silicone bristles. Um, but just to, to sort of rub their gums, they really enjoy it because these teeth are trying to push through. They almost have a sort of itch to them that you're scratching by cleaning them. But it also means when those first teeth come through, they actually are quite familiar with having something put in their mouths regularly throughout the day. Um, and just to reiterate, a tiny amount of toothpaste for a baby. The baby toothpaste only have about 500 parts per million of fluoride in them. And what we're trying to avoid and the reason it needs to be lower is because babies tend to swallow it. They don't have the ability to spit stuff out until they're quite a bit older. So it's going to stay in the mouth. That's why it needs to be a lower dose. But yeah, as soon as they have teeth, you need to be cleaning them. And the most important one is when they go to bed so that they go to bed with clean teeth and that they go into bed if they do go with a drink that it is only water and that that bottle's taken off them, that they're not using it to soothe because actually that can have an effect on the way that their teeth erupt as well. Um, and the one thing I've got, we've had quite a lot of questions this evening around sort of the two and three year olds. And in the cleft team, we see you when you're a baby, so obviously the children, and then we do them again as a group at five, at 10, at 15, if necessary. Don't wait till five, you know, try and find your own dentist if you can. It's important to have general care. But if you're worried, call the cleft team because the paediatric dental specialist would be more than happy to see your child. Each service is slightly different. Some like to see them 18 months. Sometimes it's more like three. But what we're tending to find uh, when we're doing general anaesthetics, taking children's teeth out, it's before they're five. They've not been to a dentist. And then when they do come, it's really sad to see lots of teeth that are diseased and need to be taken out. So if you have any worries, and especially if it's cleft related, don't wait for the invitation to the five year, call them and get to see the paediatric specialist. And they are consultants in paediatric dentistry. They're the best people you could see. Perfect. Okay, thank you guys so much for answering all the questions. Um, so that's all we've got time for for tonight. So thank you so much to Georgina and Rihanna for joining and taking your time talk to us it's hugely appreciated and i'm sure everyone watching feels the same thank you as well to everyone who's joined us online this video will be available on clapper's facebook page straight away and a subtitle version will be posted on the clapper's website as soon as possible if we didn't get around to answering your question in the chat remember you can get in touch at any time at info at clapper.com where clapper staff can help point you in the right direction so thank you everyone thank you thank you Thank you.